Okay, I hope you've got your pen and paper. Uh, for anyone who's arrived late, I'm just going to be really, really brief. I'm Danny, Surgical Registrar in London. We're going to go through AMCQs in a minute. Please hit Facebook share, tell your friends. This is going to last about 40 minutes or so um, and see if they want to join. Any issues, any questions about the clinical topics, type them in the social stream and uh, don't forget to leave me some feedback by pressing that feedback button at the end. That's really, really important. Thank you very much. Okay, so I hope you've got your pen and paper at the ready. Here we go. Okay, so that was your question. 56-year-old uh, man with sudden onset epigastric pain radiating to the scapulae. Um, so that could be the shoulder, that's the shoulder blades, or am I referring to epigastric pain radiating to the back? And what's the least likely diagnosis? So let's think about what the differential diagnoses are for epigastric pain. Now to do this, you need to think what organs are in the epigastrium. So let's draw a little picture of an abdomen over here. There we go. And let's think of some organs. This is how you need to think what is causing this gentleman's abdominal pain. So firstly, we'll draw a little bit of liver because the liver goes across into the epigastrium at times. So what things can affect the liver? Inflammation of any kind, hepatitis. Although that will generally give you a right upper quadrant pain. Stomach. So here's your stomach and a bit of the duodenum as well. All right, that lives in the epigastrium. So gastritis slash duodenitis. And what we're alluding to is essentially peptic ulcer disease as well. Now the ulcer may be just present or it may have perforated. And that depends very much on the history. And we're going to talk about the details of this history in a minute. Uh, let's do green for pancreas in the epigastrium. There we go, a bit of pancreas. So pancreatitis can cause epigastric pain. Uh, and don't forget the vascular causes. There's a big aorta there. And what can go wrong with the aorta? It can dissect and an aneurysm can leak and of course let's not forget the beloved gallbladder and that can cause epigastric pain there it goes leading into the second part of the duodenum the common bile duct now that can be inflamed cholecystitis biliary colic etc and also the biliary tree cholangitis so there's um, there's lots and lots of different causes of the epigastric pain and that's how you need to uh, think that's how you need to think through it so let's look at the um, causes let's look at the history in a bit more detail all right this is pain that's radiating to the back so what does that mean pain radiating to the back that means that the retroperitoneal structures are involved so let's go back to our uh, little diagram here which resides in the retroperitoneum well most importantly your big aorta is in the retroperitoneum and so dissecting or a, a dissection or a leaking AAA can lead uh, to epigastric pain or back pain, or epigastric pain radiating to the back. What else is in the retroperitoneum? Have a think. Pancreas. So pancreatitis can give you epigastric pain radiating to the back. Right, and they're your main ones. What gives you abdominal pain that radiates to the shoulder? Abdominal pain referring to the shoulder, you need to suspect this free fluid that's sitting under the diaphragm and irritating it. So abdominal pain radiating to the shoulder is something irritating the diaphragm and you must suspect free fluid and free fluid sometimes means perforation. Now in this history, it was a history of sudden onset pain. 
So he's paying attention to these little details in the history when you're a house officer and you're really rushed will really sometimes clinch the diagnosis and make sure you don't miss something important. So this is a sudden onset, think, could this be a perforation? And it's radiating potentially to the shoulders, which also fits with a bit of free fluid. Well, it's not about getting the correct diagnosis. This is about, this question is about listing and thinking of the important differentials. So if we go back to, there we go. If we go back to our question, Aortic dissection we've mentioned and leaking AAA, yes, that's a possible diagnosis. Perforated peptic ulcer, as we've mentioned, that's a possible diagnosis. In actual fact, I saw exactly this story and it was a perforated peptic ulcer, which is where I got this question from. Acute diverticulitis, how does that present? That presents with typically left iliac fossa pain, okay? Left iliac fossa pain, acute diverticulitis, because the majority of patients with diverticular disease, it affects the sigmoid colon. Yeah, so diverticulitis, that usually affects the sigmoid colon and gives you pain in the left iliac fossa. And diverticular disease, you get these out pouchings in the large bowel, and this is what gets inflamed. Okay, we won't dwell too much into the detail of that. So acute diverticulitis is the least likely diagnosis. Question number two. Okay, a 22-year-old girl complains of six weeks of bloody diarrhea and abdominal pain. Now, the first thing that springs to mind is, ah, inflammatory bowel disease, but of course, there are other causes. There are infectious causes, for example. Anyway, colonic biopsies show non-caseating granuloma formation. What the hell is that? What is the likely diagnosis? Now, this is a surgical revision, se uh, revision session and this sounds very much like a histology question, which is quite medical. But when you go to your multidisciplinary team meetings, knowing the key histological features of these four conditions are really key to understanding what's going on around you in an MDT. Let's talk about granulomas. What is a granuloma? A granuloma is a ball of macrophages, okay? And I'm going to show you some pictures. Now, the, when the macrophages coalesce and the nuclei all enter the same kind of cell, they form uh, Langhans, Langhans giant cells. Okay. Now, granulomas can be infectious, non-infectious. What does caseating mean? Caseating it comes from the word that sounds like caseating, caseous, which is like cheese-like. And that's the kind of necrosis you get in the middle of these, uh, in, in the very middle of these uh, granulomas. Now, they tend to be present with infectious causes. So TB forms caseating granulomas, okay, um, and a few other diseases. Uh, and non-infectious causes are things like Crohn's disease. So they form non-caseating granulomas. So things like Crohn's disease. Ulcerative colitis doesn't form granulomas. You get crypt architecture, uh, distortion of crypt architecture and all the glands in the, in the large bowel, they get very distorted and you get little abscesses and lots of white cells and it's all a big mess. Okay, so you don't get granulomas in ulcerative colitis. So here we go, this is a picture just for fun really. The key things are crypt distortion and crypt abscesses. That's what you're gonna see in the report for a UC histology report, for UC biopsy. Crohn's disease, non caseulating granulomas. So what you've got here is the granuloma, okay, big ball of macrophages. And microscopic colitis, now this is a vague colitis, um, that you don't get any problem with the architecture of the colon, but you get lots and lots of white cells. 
and tuberculosis you get caseating granulomas. So going back to the question, what forms non-caseating granulomas? The answer is Crohn's disease. Okay, question number three. Well, this question is all about knowing the differences between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So let's start by drawing a picture. All right, so here we've got uh, a mouth, an esophagus, call that a stomach, some small bowel, I've elongated it, a bit of terminal ileum, large bowel, rectum, and anus and this is the perineum okay rectum large bowel I'm actually going to add another layer okay onto the large onto the bowel okay let's just say that carries on all right uc gives you typically continuous areas of inflammation and the large bowel only no skip lesions just continuous areas of, uls of ulceration and inflammation and that is restricted to this, the superficial layers, just the, the very superficial layers of the large bowel. It's not full thickness. On the other hand, so red equals UC. Crohn's disease gives you full thickness ulceration and there can be skip lesions. And it doesn't just affect the large bowel, it can affect anywhere along the alimentary canal. It can give you oral ulcerations as well. And what's particularly bad sometimes for patients is when they get perianal disease. They can get lots of fistulas, loads, and it's really, really nasty. Okay, so this equals Crohn's disease. So ulcerative colitis superficial affecting only the large bowel, only the large bowel, and Crohn's disease can affect anywhere in the alimentary canal and affects, can affect the whole thickness of the wall. Crohn's disease can also give you strictures, so patients can have stricturing Crohn's disease, give them obstructive type symptoms. You can have fistulas, not only in the perineum, but between the small bowel and the large bowel. And also, fistulas joining the, small, the bowel to the skin, which are called enterocutaneous fistulas. That can be really, really nasty. This is a uh, table that basically summarises a few more differences. For example, between Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, the terminal ileum is a very common place to get Crohn's and it's seldom involved in UC. Colon, usually affected by Crohn's and is always and only affected by ulcerative colitis and that would include the rectum as well. In particular, we'll just mention about bile ducts. Primary sclerosing cholangitis, PSC, is associated with UC and there's a higher rate of it in patients with UC, but it's not the case for Crohn's disease. We've talked about skip lesions versus continuous lesions. We've talked about transmural, so full thickness inflammation and ulceration in Crohn's disease, which can sometimes cause perforations and the shallow mucosal depth in UC and stenosis or stricturing common in Crohn's and not so much in UC. And we've already mentioned granulomas. So going back to our question, which of the features not, which of the following is not a feature? of UC. Well, uh, with fistulas, we've talked about that. Fistulas you get in Crohn's potentially, but not in UC. Fine, so that's not the answer. Oral ulceration. Well, ulcerative colitis only affects the colon and the rectum. Crohn's disease can affect anywhere, so that is a feature of Crohn's disease, anywhere in the GI tract. Intestinal strictures. Well, that's a feature of Crohn's disease. Higher risk of primary sclerosing cholangitis. That's only a feature, so you can get a higher risk of PSC in ulcerative colitis. Fine, so next question.
So this is the last question before we're going to take a short break. Okay, so you're helping out an outpatient clinic because you're a very good junior and uh, you want to help everyone out all the time. <laughs> uh, 72 year old gentleman complains of intermittent fresh PR bleeding for six weeks. So fresh bleeding means bright red, okay? Examination is unremarkable. What tests are we going to do? Bowel cancer is very common and essentially you want to make sure that your old man with bleeding hasn't got it. Now you can think, there are ways of thinking, right, if this is bright red, where does this mean it's likely to be coming from? Well, if it's bright red, it's probably coming from the distal GI tract, maybe the sigmoid colon or the rectum, even the, the anal canal. Um, but that's not, you know, 100% guarantee and you've got an old gentleman, you need to make sure that you've looked at the entire length of the colon and the most sensitive way of doing this would be a colonoscopy. Now there are some instances where you think, well, colonoscopy, that's going to involve giving bowel prep, which can be really, really strong and unpleasant for uh, some patients. Now the elderly, particularly susceptible to being very, becoming dehydrated, and if they get dehydrated from taking the bowel prep, which can give them severe diarrhea and losing electrolytes and, and fluids, then they can get a bit of postural hypotension, they live on their own or something, and they get out of bed, they fall over, they break their hip, and then now they've got a real problem, okay? So think, of a, think about whether someone is suitable for an investigation that, you, that the textbooks say they should have. So in a fit 72-year-old gentleman, you could do a colonoscopy. Alternatives are CTing them with faecal tagging. It's also known as it's like a CT pneumocolon or CT colonography, where they ingest something and it makes the feces white so that the radiologist can distinguish the feces from the bowel wall and they can determine with a good degree of sensitivity if there are any masses or tumours. CT colonography won't find you tiny polyps, but in an elderly person who's frail, you want to make sure they haven't got a big cancer, it's, it's pretty good. So I've written, one of the answers here was uh, CT abdomen pelvis. Now, this doesn't mention anything about uh, faecal tagging or, or colonography, so that's why it's not the right answer. Um, uh, anorectal examination under anesthesia may become relevant if you suspect that there's a cause, for example, if you feel a polyp or... Um, if there's a fissure or anorectal examination or anesthesia may become relevant, but it's not here. Um, and flexible sigmoidoscopy we've mentioned, but really we want to view the entire uh, colon, and that's why colonoscopy would be better. So in summary, uh, old-ish patient with PR bleeding, you need to do some kind of imaging of the colon because bowel cancer is common. Of course, there are lots of other causes of PR bleeding. All right, so what I think we'll do is take a five minute break. I'll see you back here in five minutes. Welcome back for the second half. Uh, there were four MCQs. Uh, I hope you did well. Four more to go. Why can't skeletons play music in church? <laughs> because they've got no organs. I think surgeon-to-be should own up and actually tell us what your name is so we can give you the, you know, rightful applause that you deserve. Such a fantastic joke. <laughs> okay, so let's crack on. Any more jokes? They are welcome. Next question. Question number five, which you can't see yet. Here it is.
I can almost hear you thinking, what are all these words? What do they mean? Hemi this, AP that. Took me years to figure out what the difference was. I'm going to tell you what the difference is. So, this gentleman is found to have a stenosing, impalpable rectal tumour. Why am I telling you if it's impalpable? Who are going to find out? We're going to find out. And he is having an elective procedure to remove it. What is the operation? Right. Here we need to talk about the different colonic resections so that you understand what is going on in the ward round when somebody tells you, oh, this gentleman had an AP resection or whatever it is. So you understand the anatomy of what's going on. You could follow a patient's care. So let's start by drawing the large bowel. This is the appendix, the cecum. Okay, splenic flexure, transverse colon, hepatic flexure, descending colon, and now the sigmoid, and then the rectum. This is the perineum, we'll draw in the anus, anal canal, uh, rectum, okay. There we go. And a bit of terminal ileum there, all right? And now we need to draw the blood supply. Now the midgut is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery all the way up to the junction between the proximal two-thirds and the distal one-third of the transverse colon, so around about here. Okay, so the SMA will give off some right colic branches and ileocolics and uh, middle colics, etc. Okay, so this is the terminal ileum, the right colon and the transverse colon. And then we have the inferior mesenteric artery which supplies the hind gut and that will supply the left colon also the distal transverse and splenic flexure and the sigmoid colon and also will send some superior rectal branches too and the important thing to note is that there's a marginal artery that helps to distribute some of the blood around the large bowel so that if we make a resection at any one point we may be able to rely on the marginal artery though we must be careful. Another principle to remember is about the lymphatic drainage of the large bowel because this is often a route for metastatic dissemination of a large bowel tumour. Alright so it goes along the vascular supply towards the origin of the vascular supply, like that. So when we do a large bowel section, we do what we call a high tie. So we're tying off high so that we can take as many lymph nodes as we can to reduce the chances of leaving any lymph nodes in the patient positive for malignancy. So what types of resections do we have? Well, we can do right hemicolectomies which is simply removing the right colon with the blood supply in mind. We can do extended right hemicolectomies where we take some of the transverse colon as well. Now that may be to do with the position of the tumour or because of blood supply issues and left hemicolectomies and we can also do sigmoid colectomies. So that seems pretty self-explanatory. It does what it says on the tin, really. Um, so what's an anterior resection? Well, an anterior resection is when we take the rectum. So we take the rectum. We may take, we may take all of the IMA as well and have the marginal branch supply what we lay, what we leave of the splenic flexure and left colon. But we need, we need to be careful though, because of the blood supply. So that's an anterior section. Anterior section, anterior resection means an operation to remove the rectum because of a rectal tumour. But if we have a very, very low rectal tumour, 
so low that if we were to take it, we won't be able to achieve adequate clearance or it means we'll be, end up taking uh, the anal sphincters, then we need to achieve adequate clearance and acceptable function that doesn't include incontinence. And to do that, we may need to perform an AP resection, which is an abdomino-perineal resection. So it's like an anterior section, except we also take the anal canal, the whole anus and a bit of the perineum to achieve clearance. And that patient would need a flap to cover the defect in the perineum. So an AP resection is like an anterior resection, but we take the anal canal and a bit of the perineum as well. So I hope that's helped to make things slightly clearer in your mind than it was before. See, the gentleman's got an impalpable rectal tumour, so that tells you, because it's not palpable on digital rectal examination, it's high enough that we don't need to do an abdominoperineal resection. An anterior resection will do. It's a rectal tumour. It's not so low that we need to do an AP resection, so we can do an anterior resection. And wide local excision is something that's not really generally applied in uh, colon cancer surgery, although there are, I'm sure, a few exceptions to that. So the answer, anterior resection. Question number six. Okay, question number six, 24 hours following surgeries, abdomen, the guy who's just had the anterior resections, abdominal surgery, playing around with the giblets, becomes distended and he vomits. What's the most likely diagnosis? Now, what I've actually listed are four real genuine post-operative complications that can occur. Some of them not necessarily to do directly with the physical surgery, um, but things that can happen into in a, in a hospital after an operation. So uh, let's go them through them sequentially. Anastomotic leaks. So what does that mean? That's when anastomosis you join two bits of something, two luminal structures together. Okay, and you and you have some stitches to hold it while the body makes a physiological join. If those stitches start to get weak before the join happens or if the technically the join wasn't sewed together very well or if healing doesn't occur because the patient's diabetic and has a very low albumin and on immunosuppressant steroids and everything then that join can leak and if it leaks the typical story you might read in a textbook is a patient post-operatively usually say usually between day four maybe a little bit earlier okay day four and day ten a patient gets abdominal pain, spikes some temperatures and becomes septic with severe abdominal pain. Now, yes, that does happen if, there's a, if the whole anastomosis has broken down and you, get, you can get fecal uh, contents inside the peritoneal space and get generalised peritonitis. Sure, that can happen. Or it can be a bit more subtle than that. It can be a little bit of fluid that's just leaked out. Um, but you want to know about it. So either the patient needs to go to theatre and merge um, you know, very, very quickly uh, to, to have a washout and have that sorted out, um, or they, they might need a drain, because if there's a confined, well-delineated collection, that can be drained percutaneously, potentially, to avoid surgery. Is it the most likely thing to go wrong? It's not, because it's tw only 24 hours following surgery. That's 
really quite unusual. Um, if the anastomosis has leaked at 24 hours, it's probably because it, they forgot to, to join it up. <laughs> but no, that doesn't really happen. Um, so anastomotic leak at 24 hours is too early, okay? Paralytic ileus. Now, I like that better. Basically, any time someone has bowel surgery, you just have to expect a degree of ileus. So what is ileus? Well, this is how I explain it to the patients. I say, after your operation, what tends to happen is your bowel goes to sleep a bit. Instead of propelling food in one direction, it just does nothing. It becomes distended, fills with air, pours some fluid into the space in the middle, into the lumen, and makes you feel really rotten nauseous, you'll vomit all this fluid up, you won't be opening your bowels, you may be passing a bit of wind and you become very very distended. Now what causes that? Just surgery and having your bowels handled is enough to do that. Uh, having uh, an asymptomatic leak can do that as well, or maybe a very small one, uh, maybe an indication that something's not right, especially if they don't progress very well. Um, electrolyte deficiencies can do it or contribute to it as well. So it's really, really common and I'd say it's expected for most patients. And 24 hours following surgery, yeah, totally the most likely thing to be going on. All right. Peptic ulcers, that can happen following surgery because of the stress, lots of cortisol, lots of acid secretion and susceptibility to forming ulcers. Um, it, won't, it doesn't really cause distension unless it's perforated and they're complaining of pain as well. Um, and vomiting, eh, it's not the most likely thing, all right? Uh, the next thing is C. diff colitis. C. diff colitis causes abdominal pain and diarrhea that may be bloody. This patient does, this, uh, this story isn't one of diarrhea or abdominal pain. It's just distension and vomit. Sure, he's going to have some pain because of the surgery. but um, So the most likely thing, the most likely uh, answer here, the most likely diagnosis here is paralytic ileus. I just want to mention about anastomotic leak again. Um, it's not just about the textbook presentations of anastomotic leak, of abdominal pain and sepsis. They can be really quite subtle. A patient might develop an ileus, and then it may not go away. And you have to think, well, why has this patient got an ileus that has gone on for quite a few days? Is there something inside that's causing it? So you may want to scan the patient and look for a leak. Perhaps the patient just has had has got a little bit, a little bit of pain. Not only terrible pain, but they've got a little bit of pain. And you, may, and, and you might be thinking, well, actually, their pain was, it got better, and now it's suddenly got a bit worse. I wonder why. Maybe the respiratory rate has gone up a little bit. The signs and symptoms of an asthmatic leak can be really subtle. And as a junior, I couldn't understand why my, senior my seniors, the registrars, would see a patient just get a scan for everybody. It's because of that reason. An asthmatic leak can be catastrophic, potentially. Um, and you don't want to miss it, and the signs and symptoms can be very subtle. So you always got to think about it. Question number seven, penultimate question. So what is an anal fissure? Well, anal fissure is a disruption in the epithelial lining of the anal canal, which is kind of similar definition to an ulcer, disruption of the epithelium. So it's like having a little ulcer in your anal canal, which is gonna be really, really painful. And that's the kind of history these patients often give. Severe, sharp pain in the back passage upon defecation often, and sometimes there's some associated PR bleeding. And this PR bleeding is often very bright red, fresh blood. It may just, was often just some spotting on the paper when they wipe. So that's the kind of history they give. 
Now, when might you find these on examination when you inspect the anal area? Let's draw our pretty perineal picture. Most of the time, anal fissures are found posteriorly. And if they are associated with a skin tag, that's often called a sentinel pile, which is a skin tag associated with an anal fissure. But it's not a pile or hemorrhoid, it's just a skin tag. So anal fissures, posteriorly, the most common site to get them, and sometimes associated with a sentinel pile, which is an anal skin tag. Now, wh why do these anal fissures form? Well, once they do form, there's a bit of a vicious circle. There's a fissure, a fissure forms, patient gets pain when they try and open their bowels, then that leads to constipation, and that constipation, really hard, difficult feces to pass, further worsens the situation. Now the problem with fissures and why they're difficult to heal sometimes is because they have a poor blood supply. And with fissures you get a degree of anal spasm, which exacerbates this problem of poor blood supply and makes it very difficult to heal. So knowing what we know now, how do we manage them? So going back to our question, we need something to to uh, reduce the anal spasm and to maybe increase the blood supply. So perhaps something to make muscle relax, a calcium channel blocker. What's an example of a calcium channel blocker that we can use in anal fissure? That's right, diltiazem. And we don't need to give it orally, we can just give it topically. So it has local effects and we give it twice a day. GTN, we can also give, but that tends sometimes to lead to headaches, but both options will lead to resolution healing of many fissures. Dermavate over here, that's a steroid cream, and we just don't use that for anal fissure. Uh, and Instilogel might have some uh, anesthetic effect for pain relief, but it's not really gonna help heal. Um, I'm not really sure how safe that is to put on open wounds if there's any significant amount of I know, local anaesthetic getting into the bloodstream. But in any case, the right answer here is diltiazem, as we've just explained. Question number eight. Regarding fistula in ano, Goodzall rule states. Let's explain what Goodzall's rule is. This is the anal canal, and this is the ischial tuberosity. And line between these divides the perineum into anterior and posterior. Right now, when it comes to fistula in ano or perianal fistula, this is a fistula fistulous tract that connects the anus, the anal canal to the outside world, the skin of the perineum. So Goodsall's rule state that an external opening anterior to this transanal line tends to have a direct tract to the anal canal. Goodsall's rule also states that external openings posterior to the transanal line tend to have a curved course to then have an internal opening in the posterior midline. I just wanted to draw a cat. <laughs> so now you have a way to remember Goodsall's rule. Goodsall's rule or cat. There we go. So anterior openings, direct track tends to happen. Okay, so it's a rule. Posterior to the transanal line tends to have a curved track to the posterior midline. 
what else can I teach you? Important things can I teach you about perianal fissures? Or you need to have an understanding about where, where they can go. So let's draw an anal canal. This is internal sphincter. External sphincter. Now there's a theory that there's a theory, the cryptogenic hypothesis, that there are, there are glands in the intersphincteric space here. It is thought that these glands get blocked and they can form abscesses. So you've got all the abscesses forming here. That's going to be, it's not going to end well, is it? Well, now there's an abscess. The pus wants to escape somehow, so it can escape into the anal canal. It can also escape into the perineum. So then we can get different types of fistulas. We can get intersphincteric fistula. We can get transphincteric fistula. Suprasphincteric fistula. Now if we draw the levator, I don't remember your anatomy, there's a levator ani. We can even have supralevator abscesses. Now this supralevator abscess can basically tell us that this cryptogenic theory is not the only cause for, 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 for anal, perianal fistulas. Abscess is caused by some gyny bits, maybe an ovarian, tube ovarian abscess or diverticulitis in the pelvis can be a cause. Maybe it's big ischiorectal abscess caused by some kind of skin problem rather than this cryptogenic theory. Maybe that's causing a fistula, yeah? So there we go. Now, why is this important? Well, how do we manage it? Well, if we've got us an extra sphincteric fistula here, we can lay this open. I mean, it's cutting it open, exposing it to the outside world, letting it heal that way. But if it's going through the sphincters, and we do that, we'll end up cutting the sphincters, and that can have obvious consequences. If both ends close and there's pus in the middle, patients can come back with the current abscesses. So we can put in that tract a seton. Just have it loosely to keep the tract open. And then later on, clever surgeons can put things, maybe fistula plugs or do clever things to try and help the fistula heal. Okay, so that's a brief talk on fistula in ANO. Sorry, Danny, it's posterior to 6 o'clock position. That's quite correct. Um, anterior is 12 o'clock and then it goes in the clock face so that posterior is 6 o'clock and uh, the right hand side is nine o'clock and the left hand side is three o'clock. So posteriorly is a six o'clock position. So thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, please, please um, go down, click on feedback and give me some really, really important feedback. If you leave your email address in the feedback set, in the fee on the feedback form, I can let you know when the next tutorial is coming up. So until then, bye-bye.